Hey there, everybody. This is Carson Grubaugh. Hi, I'm Sean Robinson, and today we are joined by a special guest. Who is that special guest, Carson? NFN Callion, and an amazing painter. You can see he's got one of his his paintings there behind them. Um, and he actual he's joining size. us. Yeah, that's big, big painter. So we're we're so happy to have you, Callion. Um, really appreciate you joining us. Uh, I'll, I'll say real quick, the, the way I linked up with Callion is he posted that that painting and one other painting on the a moment of Cerebus fan site and, you know, shared that that work. And I looked his work up on Instagram and then went to his website. And, Holy crap, this guy's really good um, and reached out and started a conversation. And then, Sean, you want to explain like what this episode in particular is about and, and uh, what? Yeah, uh, Carson and I have been mulling around for a while the idea of actually talking about uh, for what is a touchstone for a lot of the conversations we have, which is Cerebus, uh, specifically Cerebus by Dave Simon Gerhard, the 6,000 page, uh, 24 year epic uh, that ran from 1977 to 2004 and uh, has been the subject of the epic, uh, uh, the epic uh remaster <laughs> that I've been doing for about seven years on and off now. Um, and uh, because we have a this is a touchstone in so many of the conversations that Carson and I have, it seemed like doing a series analysis would be very interesting. And you know, we, we'll talk about some of the reasons for that. But one of the reasons for that is because it really hasn't gotten the kind of analysis as an entire work that it deserves. So uh, today, we're going to dive into that a little bit and give an overview of the series and sort of uh, you know, hopefully preview some of the things that we're going to be talking about in depth during the actual uh, series, but also sort of give us some of our general impressions of it, things that make it a uh, worthwhile uh, endeavor. And uh, the other thing we wanted to note today uh, is that uh, last week, one of um, Cerebus's, I would say, it's safe to say, biggest fans, uh, Mr. Jeff Seiler, uh, passed away. He uh, died. He's a incredibly nice guy, lived in Minnesota, uh, has been in touch with Dave and Gerhard for a long period of time. And he actually was the proofreader for the majority of the uh, restored volumes. So Jeff would go through meticulously and uh, read the books. He read them in the monthly form, and he also would read the trade form. And then he would go through and make me a list of everything that he would flag uh, as a potential issue, especially in some of the first half of the book, uh, Dave used, you know, things like uh, <laughs> uh, single quotes versus double quotes and in interesting like uh, ways that are not entirely grammatical. And um, Jeff just gave me this raw document. He would literally send me like 80 pages worth of single line notes on the books. And I would sort of sift through it and say, OK, well, this is like an idiosyncratic thing that we got to keep. And then some of the stuff I would fly, you know, run up the flagpole to Dave. And anyway, uh, Jeff is an incredible proofreader, really uh, kind guy. And, um, you know, we're going to miss him a lot. And uh, the fandom is not going to be the same without him. And, uh, you know, Carson <laughs> was talking to him right before we launched the Strange Death of Alex Raymond uh, Kickstarter. And uh, it was Carson's idea to extend the uh, signed and numbered edition so that it was going to be 301 so that Jeff could get his special number 301. And uh, alas, that was not to be. Yeah, any any time Jeff uh, got any signed and numbered product from Babe, it was three hundred one in tribute to the fact that the series lasted three hundred issues, and Jeff always wanted that next issue, I think. And so we <laughs> set we set the limit at three hundred one for Jeff, and to it it just like I don't even know the guy, and I'm usually a pretty I don't want to say callous person, but I don't react to people's deaths and. To know like it was so important to me that he got 301 and then the fact that the delays with the book and the misprint kept him from ever seeing the book that i i know he was one of the most you know, like eagerly awaiting like backers that we had just like i, I was yeah it, it bummed, bummed me out for a couple of days knowing that it just seemed cruel and so um, if you when you, when you guys are reading the um, you know the remastered or uh, editions, I hope that you'll uh, think of Jeff and uh, pour one out for him. He's a you know nice guy and uh, very skilled guy, and we'll miss him. Yeah. So 
Uh, the other thing, another reason that in, it incentivized, we have a number of reasons for this episode is we hit like 250 people, which I guess is like a big Ooh. thing. It, 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 it seems <laughs> small, but also like the fact that 250 people want to listen to what we have to say is awesome. So there's a number of things that are like, okay, we should do the thing that like most of the people who originally followed us um, were Cerebus fans. And so we want to do that. And and Callian, you're you're the perfect foil for this because you're a huge Cerebus fan. But as you say, you've never talked to anyone else. So what's what's that like? Like, how did you come to this? And how did like, how is it to be removed from the fandom that me and Sean are used to engaging with? Yeah, it's amazing for me to hear you guys talk about another person who's such a big fan, their proofreading thing. You guys know who this is. Like for me, it was like eyes into a world that I, I couldn't have imagined. I mean, I, I knew it must exist, but I, I'm 39 and I started reading Cerebus, I would say uh, in 92. So I was 10. I think the first book that I bought was Jaka's Story, which for a 10 year old was, was something. And then I went, I went backwards um, first and got, uh, I think I got High Society and then Church and State 1 and 2 and then got the first one and then went from there. Uh, but uh, I, it made such an impression on me. It's hard to even, uh, when you come to something so young, it's hard to even imagine the different ways that it impressed itself upon you structurally. And in terms of art, it, when you become an artist later, and then I look at some of the things I do, sometimes I wonder if even I, all my work references other famous paintings or, or comic books or whatever. And that was such an integral part of Cerebus, the references to Wilbur Roach or whatever. And I just, maybe that just becomes ingrained in you just take it for granted. Oh, you just, yeah, you could just throw this in there and make your own point mm -hmm. using that. I don't, it's hard to say all the effects it's had on me, but uh, it's the only comic that I still read uh, consistently. I'll, I'll open it up and read it once a year. And I haven't read comics since I was, I don't know, maybe in college. So, wow. yeah. Did you, so it's did amazing you grab, to just be a part of this conversation. Yeah. Did you grab the Jocka story in the, the phone book format or were you in grabbing the phone issues? Book. Yeah, I've, I've never bought an issue. I always bought phone books. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. And what was it that like, like what at 10, what, what were you doing that you, cause I just turned 40. So we're, we're pretty we're, similar yeah. in age. Um, so it's interesting to hear that. What was it that made you grab that? I think I may have read understand. I don't remember who was understanding comics. I was, I've always wanted to be a comic book artist and never happened for me, but that's what I wanted to do. And I think I read understanding comics or something like that. And they had a panel of Cerebus. And I think he's sitting in a dungeon and he has his arm like this. I don't remember yep. what panel it is. 100%. That's the exact one. He's got like this. It's from yeah. Church and State to the first uh, sequence where he's being uh, uh, inundated by the McGrew brothers and the uh, Roach. The Secret yeah. Sacred Wars uh, Roach. Yeah, that. <laughs> and I, I saw that panel and I said, what? is that and then i there was a comic book store in madison wisconsin in a basement on state street for if anybody went to that comic book store it was amazing and uh i used to just sit there my, my dad had to go up there he was a mathematician he'd go to the university library and i'd go and sit and look at these cerebus comics just look at the drawing this, this is amazing and then somehow jocka's story became the first one and the sense of pacing of the story uh maybe is the greatest ever. I mean, it's not that maybe he didn't surpass it in some structurally and some other things, but just that sense of timing and how everything fit together. And that was it for me. I don't think I fully understood it in the way that an adult understands things, you know, like I got it, but I didn't get it. I was going to say, uh, that's a lot for a 10 year old to be like the pacing of that, like, damn. Yeah, that's, that's what I was interested in. I said, huh? cause you know, he would just be throwing this ball against the wall and you're like, and then there's a conversation happening or whatever however he was doing and i just remember thinking this is incredible and, and it's uh, like that a was... bomb that 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 book i mean the entire time you've got this this simmering conflict that's like underneath the surface and then all of a sudden mm -hmm. yeah you know everything that's simultaneously intense. coming to a head sean yeah. how did you that we've we've worked and together for a long time and talked about service but i don't know that i've ever heard like how you came to it originally i know how you came to work with dave but 
Yeah. So, so uh, very similar to your story, Kalyan. Uh, I uh, had read. I was a big nut when I was, you know, third grade, fourth grade for the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. You might have heard of them. Uh, little independent comic. And uh, I read like the Archie ones and, you know, all that stuff. And uh, I went to a comic store and got a bunch of the Mirage ones. And then the next thing I know, I found those first edition reprints that had the color added to them. Mm. And uh, I read, I got all the first edition ones and I found that the issue was Cerebus. And I was like, well, who the hell is this guy? And, you know, even at the time, <laughs> like my eye was attuned to the drawing differences and the lettering differences. And it was clear to me that this was someone else's thing inserted into this, you know, Eastman and Laird artwork that was very familiar to me. And so going to a comic store from there, uh, I basically asked the guy behind the counter and he's like, oh yeah, we got a bunch of them. And here's a Jocka story uh, he hands me. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, my parents were going to go on a trip. This was when I, the summer and I was 12. So this would have been the same time, uh, Kalyan, that you were, because I'm two years older than you. Okay. And uh, my family went on a road trip when I was 12 and I had three books. I, you know, I had a certain amount of money they were going to give me to, to buy some things. And I bought three things. And one of them was the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle uh, role-playing uh, game. And then the other two were Jocka Story and Melmoth. And, <laughs> Damn. <laughs> and I, I was just hooked for life. I mean, I, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that something existed that had this prose style you know the, his his knockoff um his knockoff oscar wilde which by the way if you go back and read the stuff that he's you know pastiching for that it, it's i mean it's it's right up there you know like he yeah. just totally takes this pastiche and develops the pastiche so that it has its own internal consistencies and its own you know justifiable quality um and then you you contrast that with like you're saying these scenes where it just seems like nothing's happening until you realize what is happening throughout the entire scene and that you've just missed this subtext until the end of the scene and then the explosion at the end. And I mean, I, I just was totally hooked. And uh, it seemed to me that Melmoth had a similar interesting structure. And, uh, you know, I didn't know anything else about the series other than these two books and the fact that I just read them over and over and over and over again. And um, that was actually my first kind of experience with an experience I've had several times since then where a certain facet of a work of art is so interesting to me that I have to take in that part and process it because I'm not ready to move on to something else. I wasn't ready to move on to the to the monthly book for a really long time because I needed to process what was actually happening in those those first two volumes. It was like, you know, you, you listen to an album that you end up loving, but the first two songs are so good sometimes that you can't get past those first two. It's like you've got to solve the puzzle, you know. I felt like I was solving those first two, um, those first two volumes. That, that's weird because I, I, I'm like a late bloomer compared to you guys. Like my interest in comics started with those Archie Ninja Turtle ones, and then I was more like the like Jim Lee X Men, and like that was comics to me for a long time. But I saw Cerebus in a Wizard magazine, and like they were, it, it must have been issue two hundred. Um, that they were saying he made it to 200 he's got 100 more and the art like burned it's the same way Callion, where you saw that one panel and it burned itself in your head it, it it burned itself in my head and the idea that someone was attempting 300 issues really appealed to me but sean unlike you i i didn't want to engage with it until it was done like oh, wow. i didn't i didn't want to engage with something that might not be finished. Um, I, I felt like, I don't know, I just remember being however old I was when that happened, 12, 13, reading Wizard Magazine and making a mental check. This Cerebus thing looks awesome, but it's not gonna be done until 2004. <laughs> and so I'm just gonna mentally like put it aside. There was one time where there was a comic shop in the mall and I, I went in, I was probably, I was working at the mall. I was probably like 17 at that time, 16, 17. I was working at Cinnabon, which was right across from the comic shop. And I think I found an issue. I know I found an issue. It was, uh, God, I, I think it's issue 214. And it has Rick Veach in it wearing like drag. He, he's mm -hmm. like in garters and shit. 
and run along a wall and the wall is like this big phallic symbol and it's probably one of the most perverse issues of Cerebus and that was just the one they happened to get I was like there's that Cerebus thing and I have some spare cash and uh, I'll check it out and I picked it up and I was I was like really <laughs> the picture of Rick, Rick Veach and all that get up just kind of turned me off I was like Ugh. <laughs> and so I just was like nah not for me uh, but it it stuck in my head and when it finally finished I said okay now I'm gonna go check that thing out and I went and bought you know the the first because I'm I have to do that too I can't jump I know you're supposed to go read high society or chocolate story first but I was like no you start from the beginning and you read it to the end like and now it's complete I can do that safely um uh, so I went and bought this one and uh, yeah I mean immediately fell in love and bought the you know I, I didn't have never had too much money but bought I think I bought up to Melmoth um and and that was while well, I would have been in like uh just working and then going back to college at that time and I got up to Melmoth and then I was poor and I couldn't finish it so I eventually pirated it I pirated the whole thing online and I'm actually glad I did that because when I reread it, I read it where there were scans of the issues with the letters and all of the ads and how Dave presented himself on the back. So my understanding and experience of Cerebus includes all of the back matter. And I think that informs me. I, I don't think I've ever actually sat and read it through just the, the comic content. I've always, even though I have, more of the volumes now i've i've I, I kind of purposely go back to those pirated scans uh, when i read it because i like having all of that other material so so kalyan is you is your context completely without any the letters pages and covers and things like that i i complete without letters pages covers i bought the book uh, i think there's maybe two volumes of it you guys know better than me of his letters right where he responds <laughs> i uh maybe in 2010 i bought one of those okay. and read that so i have some context of his letter responses but that's it i only ever bought the phone book so whatever's in those that's what i and i actually as you were talking i seem to remember i think i bought up to um mines mm -hmm. And then, so that's issue 200. And then it was only after I think the whole series was finished, I guess in 04 or what, uh, that I bought guys through uh, the last day. And I, I, I guess we can get further into this, but I, I didn't, I think you can't take those away from, it, it's a whole thing. Right. Uh, but uh, as an artist, I, I didn't enjoy the last third of, of Cerebus. Right. Yeah, I know a lot of people did for whatever the reason is, but uh, and I thought it was fantastic. A lot of it was fantastically executed, but I just stopped caring. The way you're driven to be interested in all the synchronicity and the yeah. the nuance of the story for me was gone. In fact, I, I felt like maybe some of the characters weren't even the same people anymore. I was like, what is this? R so, right. Yeah. And and uh, and I, I think that that's one of the things that we might um, it might be interesting as we develop to sort of see if we have a sort of global structure to it that explains some of those kinds of things like Carson and I have talked I think we've talked on camera a little bit uh, before about my sort of pet theory as a structure to the work as a whole is that when when Dave inserts himself into the story in minds and he tells Cerebus the character uh, you know these are alternatives and this can happen to you. I can change this. I can change that. He's essentially breaking the story. Um, and, uh, you know, he gives a little explanation in reads where he says the series is actually going to end at 200. And, mm. and then he has like a faux reader response where the reader is shocked and horrified and everything. And then he comes back and says, no, no, don't worry. I'm just joking. Um, but, uh, my sort of pet structural theory about the work as a whole is that, you know, Dave as the writer and the creative force is having his cake and eating it too in the sense of breaking the story at that two-thirds barrier and sort of making a clean break when you say that about the characters being totally different I mean I, I think that that is a almost universal response to like post issue 200 Jaka um, yeah I, I know I read it in one interview where he said that that wasn't the case 
I don't know if it's a case. Sometimes I think maybe creators don't know themselves. Right. I don't know if that's a case of that or if you just flat out lied. I'm not sure what, mm -hmm. what that response was about, but I, I think that character for sure is, is not the same. And he even goes well, back and I think uh, he criticizes her in Jaka's story saying, look, she's no hero. Like she put everybody in this danger or whatever, but it's definitely Jaka's story is way more complex than that. It's not right. about a hero or anti-hero. It's, it's just, you know, it's a full fledged character. Right. And, yeah. and a lot of the critical response uh, that such as there is to the work as a whole seems to he a hinge on whether or not you think that Dave as author is didactic, whether he's actually trying to tell us something at all times or whether he's just presenting something to you and allowing you to draw your own kind of conclusions. Um, like like you said about Jocko's story, I mean, every person in there is a person. Uh, they're all full fledged characters and uh, you know, I, I wonder sometimes uh, if the response to some of those things maybe is frustrating. And I mean, I don't know about it, if that's the case with this particular work, but like sometimes it seems like artists become more didactic as they go because they don't get the response they're looking for. <laughs> mm. You know, like pe people didn't get it. I gotta, I gotta hit the hammer harder, you know? Um, yeah. I think mm. it was, I, I don't know how you guys feel about it. I think it was a mistake on his part to think that way. But I, I, I but again, I can't, t I, just to back up, I think the service may be the greatest piece of 20th century art. One could make that argument. I agree. Like, yeah. yeah. It's not just comics. Like, yeah. 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 I agree I, that the totality I, of it is one of the most important documents. That, see, this is where I'm glad I have the letters. Because I think in the history of mankind, it's the only piece of art where the artist went on a search for capital T truth. And they did that one month at a time in the public eye and responsive to public feedback. And, and, and that's all contained in one package. There's plenty of artists and philosophers and stuff that have had their entire life be that search for truth, but it's never like one product you can pick up. You kind of pick up this book and this book and this book, and you may see their ideas developing. And then I can't think of any other instance where they would be getting fan letters that they're responding to and they're interacting with fans at the convention. And, and Dave is actively testing theories against it's, I don't think it's the best way to do it at a remove virtually through letters with it instead of going out in the world and interacting with people but he's testing all of his theories against the audience and i cannot think of any other document you could have that encapsulate encapsulates that in a well executed formally compelling enjoyable like it, it just yeah it stands alone as such a bizarre unique accomplishment well, you could you could see it by analogy to the stylistic shifts that the book has. Uh, so uh, here I'm gonna I'm gonna set that up so so that we have the analogy in, or the the building blocks for the analogy in place. Uh, in the book, they have fairly dramatic stylistic shifts in terms of the characters and uh, how they're rendered and things like that. And some of those are story driven, and others are definitely driven by the need to experiment. You can see Dave as an artist as restless. And is attempting to come to solutions for these problems as he goes um, and you could make the argument and like if he was working in like a japanese context where he had an editor or something like that the editor might be like oh hey, hold on kid uh, you know don't <laughs> maybe don't take that so quite so far there um but the the restlessness gives him new kinds of solutions to uh commonly faced problems uh, similarly in the story you can argue that he violates audience expectations so often um, that it is destructive to the narrative. On the other hand, that audience violating expectations is what drives him to getting these larger points that would otherwise not be able to be contained in the story. Um, you know, people were so frustrated with the end of church and state because he arrives at the moon and here's a guy that tells him everything. Uh, but on the other hand, are you going to tell me that you would wish away that scene? You would wish away the, the uh, destruction of the earth multiple times. You would wish away like an analogy 
to sexual reproduction for the beginning of the universe. I mean, that's just uh, that whole thing is so genius. And yet it would be impossible to have that scene without violating the audience expectations, because, you know, it, it, it's like it's like the what makes it a poor fantasy novel makes it an interesting philosophical text. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's interesting. If it, so your thesis is the whole, even the first 200 issues contained those, sub, those things that the audience at the time viewed as subversive, not just the last third where almost the entire audience had changed their mind about what is this or, right. or was shocked. Yeah. And that's very interesting. I, I think as, a, as an artist, it's exactly that, that, that it was one piece and nobody had ever just done one piece. And he elevated his own craft. Of, it would be as if Duke Ellington recorded one song. Like, okay, <laughs> yeah. We're going to do one song and it's going to be awesome. It's going to take us 30 years. We're doing it. <laughs> and uh, or one album or whatever, you know, and uh, that's what he did. And um, I have to wonder whether his, I, I, you guys would know better than me. I'm curious about what his evolution as a person I've read about it did to him as an artist and whether they're actually, he actually did lose something of his ability to um, make good art. Not that the structure wasn't great, not that, but the plot and the characters are no longer compelling, which is a, a key part of, of, of narrative. For me, at least, I don't know. Maybe some people view it differently. But before you you go, before we like get get into that, is that is that is it is it the fact that it is like Duke Ellington making one thirty year long song? Is that why you say this is the greatest? Not just the greatest comic, but the like. What is it that makes you say the greatest piece of art of the twentieth century? Well, I think you have to examine. Uh, like you said, you have to start with truth right? Without that, there's no great artists. And I think all great artists are moving that direction. But then there's the second point that you made that then there's things split off. So, oh, this book is great, but I don't really care for these other books or whatever. This is a single continuous narrative. And he's able to examine things in such, and when you do it that way, uh, the piece itself takes on a form that separate books could not take on even if i say oh the last third doesn't fit at all it still must be included and then you still have to consider it in the piece mm -hmm. and even if i hate it there's something about it which is compelling when included in the whole thing there's something compelling about it to look at either as the evolution of a man or the evolution of the of the form itself and on top of that i think he elevated comics to a level that nobody's ever taken them before in my view uh, and I've read yeah. a lot of things, but to me, there's nothing which touches it. To me, if you'd sit down and do something every day, and that's what you're thinking about, that one thing every day, uh, it's going to go someplace that nobody else could do. There's a discipline. Uh, yeah, and, there, but, you know. and I think, Sean, too, you made a point about not having an editor. Not, none of that would be. So right. this this is the conundrum of Dave and, and Callian. You said um, who he became as a his evolution as a person. Did that kind of affect him as an artist to where like you feel like he was a less potent artist in the last 100 issues or something? I would I would flip that and and say he's an artist first and his evolution as an artist affected him as a person. Mm. Um, what he was doing in the art, because that is all he was doing all day, every day. Right. And and so his entire um this is my and this is why i like having all the back matter and stuff because i see him playing roles he's never just dave like if you read the letters and you see what activities he was engaged in it's always in my mind and this is something we can explore when we do a more series by you know issue by issue or chunk by chunk breakdown is uh cerebus the first volume is the the new artist and he's out rough wild searching for gold, which is what Sarah is doing. And he's trying a million different techniques and, and stuff like that. And then, then he goes on this quest to become like the top of his industry. And that matches up with, with uh, like high society. And then it's like, oh, well, 
there's a level above being prime minister, you be Pope. And through that run is where Dave becomes the, the megastar. And then at, at the end of that, you can see him get tired. And, and he's always presenting himself in the back matter. At, and there's pictures of him and Gerhard like living it up and stuff. And, and, and then it goes to Jaka's story. And Dave becomes domesticated in his presentation of himself. He quits answering letters and stuff. And then Melmoth, which is so claustrophobic and dark like you look at dave's pictures of himself during that time and it's like in the corner with the lights low he quits answering fans mail um and then you get to uh what follows that up um you get into reads flight or flight yeah flight flight which women starts reads and minds it boom it explodes back out and all of a sudden he's back out in the public eye um On tour get, yeah, you get into mothers and daughters and his kind of exploration of, of I don't want to say socialism, but um, just collectivism. And all of a sudden he's doing Spirit of the Independence tour and stuff. And those change like immediately. As soon as he enters that new story, his presentation of himself changed. So I don't know that there was a person, Dave Sim. He was an evolving, like until you get to issue 200. He was, I, in my opinion, he was he was searching for truth and he was using the art he, he, him as an artist, the roles that he was playing. And he talks about this too, in his writing, like I I'm the writer, I'm the penciler, I'm the inker, I'm the letterer. And he seems very comfortable with inhabiting different personalities. And each one of those was like giving him data on his search for truth. And so the artist affected the person and then you get you get towards um, like issue 186 and all of all of that stuff. And then he starts to assert himself as the person. And then 200 is like from here on out, I'm not exploring truth anymore. I've done this many years of research into truth and now I've decided what it is and let me tell you about it. So that's how I see the roles reversed is Dave wasn't Dave Sim, the person until I don't, I think it comes after guys, honestly, to me is like, if you, I think most people say, I ah, read it up to 200 and ditch it to me. It's like, I think guys is one of my favorite, at least for right now. And then it's like, uh, it falls into the didactic stuff. Yeah. Um, I'll be curious to hear, uh, <clears throat> if on a reread, if you're going to maintain the position that it's always didactic, uh, you know, guys is a fine example because, uh, we, we spend 25 issues in a bar and we see uh, men in close quarters after having spent, you know, a long time talking about uh, sex differences and, uh, you know, talking about women in a negative light. We have 25 issues of guys basically making fart and dick jokes, uh, <laughs> fucking with each other, um, wasting their lives away uh, while they're drinking in a bar. And and the point of it doesn't seem to be drinking is bad. The point of it seems to be drinking is a way to control men's like uh, aggressive actions which is not necessarily like what you would think would be the didactic you know delivery it's not like he sat down to write something that's going to persuade men that they need to go out and play sports instead of drinking or something like that or get you know there's not like a point to it other than an observational this is what i've seen when i'm around people who are drinking in a bar um so i I, I might disagree about the didacticism of the of the later portion. Um, what I what I think maybe structurally to me makes sense is that these cracks that he's created in the narrative by inserting himself into it have created fissures in the story. And then from basically issue 200 on, everything that happens is subject to this kind of leakage from the real world. Uh, you know, Africa all of a sudden being part of uh, the narrative. Um, having all of a sudden uh, Muslim and Christian and uh, Jewish uh, holy documents uh, inside of there. It's not just some previous iteration of the world, but they're exact quotations uh, from it. All those things are examples of this kind of like real world leakage uh, coming in. And, you know, I think that really comes to a head in the double issue that starts off the last day where Cerebus is just asleep the whole time. And it's the first time for a long time that Dave, the narrator, takes over and is like, and here's some Bible commentary. 
<laughs> you know, uh, it's 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 like he's sleeping, and while he's sleeping, the writer of the book is going to give us Bible commentary. Um, and yeah, I suppose that's didactic in a sense, but you don't get the sense that he's trying to create a religion or something. You don't get the, the sense that Dave is attempting to get followers or persuade anyone. He's just telling you what he's thought about, and you know whether that's positive to the to the arc of the story i think there's no doubt the first 200 issues are more cohesive than anything that follows in the sense that they reference each other they're obviously knit together they're they're based on some previous notes or documents everything is like pushing towards these different points however i don't think that that means that they're completely unconnected i think that it's just a different kind of structure it's more of an essay format um which you know once again is not what people look for in a fantasy novel uh, but might be more rewarding in a different kind of sense. And I, and I think that, that that's exactly why those last hundred issues have to be looked at as part of what makes it so great. Because if you, uh, in the fine art world, if we see something in the abstraction goes to a point where we can't understand it, then we, we look at it and we say, well, what is it? And if we look at this as a whole, if you take those away, it's just a fine story, one of the great stories. But if you add in those last hundred issues, you all of a sudden get this weird, crazy thing that only this one guy could have made over the course of his life. And that's part of what makes it so great. I don't enjoy it, but that's part of what makes it so great, I think. I also okay. wonder whether, he, I, 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 as you were talking, he, I don't enjoy the last uh, hundred issues more for the things that you were saying. I, I read them. But the story doesn't hold to it doesn't hold together as a narrative the same way. There's a lot of things like that, and so I don't like it so much. But I think Dave keeps on coming back to 186 as the reason people don't like the later <laughs> work. But I'm not sure if that's actually the case. I don't care about 186. I mean, that's yeah. something that he thought for right. me. Whatever. That's not. That doesn't really mean much to me as I go forward reading. Right. I think I think at the time it caused a break with and I don't know I mean I've only worked with him later on but I do think there was a backlash among his peer group at the time where he started to feel isolated I don't know exactly how that worked within the the sales you know I don't know where the drop off in the sales came and everything but I I do think there was a backlash because it wasn't just that he was saying things about like making generalities, not even about women, but I mean, the whole thing is a metafiction, right? And it, it's a, I, and Callie and I wonder if this is, you know, one of the things you think it's like one of the, if not the greatest piece of 20th century, it's like, it's a, it's like a meta metafiction. He's, he's taking in the, in the same way that like the, you know, the Bible is like, just a compression it's like you take all of mythology and you like juice it and you concentrate it i think he took like the previous 200 years of artistic production and like just juiced the essence of it out you know because of all of the parody because of all of the parroting the mockingbird nature of stuff he like squeezed everything um, down to its essence and I, I so I don't see him talking about women I see him compressing out the last 200 years worth of stereotypes about the masculine and the feminine and you know I but I don't think that it was necessarily right away the negative reaction to that he was he was referencing specific people like Jeff and Vijaya Smith and Alan Moore and he was he was kind of playing inside he likes to play insider baseball and give those behind the scenes stories and and he he taught that I think that's one of his experiments that he was running during reads is he got interested in gossip and what does gossip do and he found out what gossip <laughs> does and but he had to do it he had to like and, and he talks about that. It it cleaves and gossip and it like from that point on in the story, you're either cleaved from him or you're cleaved to him. You're kind of like, I'm sticking with you or you're like, fuck that guy, man. He's like dishing gossip. Um, 
And I think that was the initial reaction rather than this, like, oh, he's a misogynist. He's against he would, he had talked about how he was anti-feminist in the president's letters way before that. I think the first time is he talks about he's out with his girlfriend and they're at a they're at a restaurant and like the girlfriend and the waitress are kind of being catty to each other. And he's like, what the hell? Um, and somehow wrapped that in defendant. He'd been talking about that for a while. I think I think what happened in 186. Sean, correct me because you're probably the most accurate in, in what happens. In what, that's the issue where he talks about the incident with Jeff and Vijaya Smith, right? And that's where the industry is like, you know, like Jeff Smith's a great guy. This guy's being a dick. Yeah, it's it's interesting, um, you know, as far as if this had been just like a self-preservation thing, like if he had just stepped into a beehive and was like, oh, shit, I'm in a beehive. I better get out. Um, you know, he would have done things very differently. I think this is part it, it kind of hits home into his sort of basic philosophical uh, view that people should be free, free to express what they want to express. He got, you know, bags of hateful letters and he printed them in the back of his magazine. Uh, he made those issues longer so that people could have their letters in there. Uh, you know, he ran uh, uh, ads for the Comics Journal that were, had drawings of him as a concentration camp uh, guard. <laughs> And his circulation was something like four times what the Comics Journal was uh, at the time. So he, you know, he gave them fuel for their fire. Um, and I, I don't mean these as a, you know, I don't mean these as a negatives to him. I'm saying that this is this is what happens when you say something inflammatory and also believe that people should be able to have their responses no matter what. I think that's the people the thing that people miss about sort of post like post-religious conversion, Dave, is it's not like Dave is sitting there like tis tisking all day at other people who aren't behaving like him. He just behaves the way that he behaves because he thinks it's the right thing for him to do. Uh, you know, he does. And the he thing could that care he less doing. what other people do. He, he'll, he'll, he'll tell me many times he'll like, well, I don't think, you know, he'll like, in my view, that's, you know, like, he'll, like he's, it's even in, you don't know, Jack, the other book that we made together, like, he puts the thing like, hey, hey Carson, you know, you're going to start considering praying five times a day now. And he has me go like, nah, I'm good. And he's like, OK. And that, that is his attitude. Yeah, um, I mean, yeah, I, but I, I I work with him as closely as anybody else. And, uh, you know, I've been an atheist since I was six years old. I didn't need to read atheist propaganda. Um, but, you know, some of the greatest thinkers that I've ever read are, are theists. And, uh, you know, D Dave's theism is an awful lot more honest uh, than virtually any other religious person that I've met. So, I mean, I have tremendous respect for him and I re respect for his hard earned um, thoughts. That doesn't mean that I will have the same thoughts that he does. And I don't think he expects that from me. <laughs> you know, there, there's there's two things I want to get to that both of you have said before we get too far, because they're both interesting to me. Um, one, Sean, you're talking about how incendiary he was at the time. That was the hat that he was putting on, his public persona that he was putting on during Reeds to go with the story of Reeds. Um, those in the same way that spirits of independence happened while he was looking at group activities, incendiary behavior was like what he was exploring in the book. So he was exploring that in, in the real world. That totally makes sense. And then Callian, you talk about, um, you, you talked about abstraction um, it made me think of the only other kind of analog in the fine arts that I could think of comparable to what Dave did, which is Mondrian and mm -hmm. how Mondrian is the one other one artist I can think of that has this very clear, slow progression towards what he's trying to do. And then when he hits it, it just it's it's Mondrian forever until he gets to New York and then all of a sudden like he's dancing with young girls and he loosens up a little bit like he figures how to loosen up within the confines of his style so I wonder if if you see because you were referencing um the abstraction I wonder if you see any other analogs like that in in the fine art world you know I've never even thought about what could be an analog to to Dave or to Cerebus to me uh I, that's something I'd really have to think about way more. To me, it was just such a, it's such a singular piece of work. And I think that's part of the reason why it's, 
uh, part of the reason is uh, the, the decline in popularity. And another part is it's so singular and there's nothing you can compare it to. It's, very, it's much easier to say something is great when you could say it's so great. It's like uh, this other thing. It's like Tolstoy or whatever. <laughs> But what are you going to say? What is it like? It's like nothing. There's nothing quite like it. So you got to say, well, you just have to read it. And that's a much more difficult uh, place to start. So I think that's part of the thing that holds it back from people realizing it's so great is how unique it is. Yeah. I don't think it's any coincidence that all three of us uh, saying that, that this is a great work of art and great work of art as a whole are all visual artists. Uh, I don't know if people who are called upon to write about comics are lacking in visual skills or lacking in critical skills. But I mean, it seems to me, you know, people say like the shorthand for it is like, it's a comic artist's comic, right? Uh, which by which they mean here, go steal from this. Um, this will show you how to do this type of scene. Uh, but, but, uh, you know, you don't really see good writing about music unless it's by an actual musician. Mm. Uh, writing about music from non-musicians is basically like fashion discussion uh, or like press release regurgitation or talking about somebody's fans. Uh, you know, you rarely get to read really good analysis of music and it's because people don't understand music the way that other composers do, right? Uh, I think the same thing goes with Cerebus. It's, it's, it's funny, like where you can talk about the narrative and everything like that, but really what's there is this complex interlocking of the narrative and all of the formal elements and how these things change over time and sort of how they map onto each other, which is not something that somebody who doesn't know how to draw is necessarily, or doesn't know how to organize space visually is necessarily equipped to uh, to to analyze. Um, I, I, I'm not going to call out this particular person, but I, I read a I read a review of uh, something very recently by a professor who writes about comics, and it was one of the most ludicrous things I've ever read. Um, it was a <laughs> review of a of a intensely visual graphic novel that mentioned the visuals once in a parenthetical. It said "nice drawings" or something along those lines, and everything else was a slag. And it's like, you didn't even look at the fucking book. Like you're reading the words. That's not the same as reading the comic. You know, you didn't take it in. I, I don't I don't know if that's part of the, you know. I think we, before we before we started, I said that uh, I felt like visually in terms of my art, the person I was competing with was, was not another painter. I was competing with Christopher Nolan for people's attention. <laughs> And yeah. if and that's actually not a bad. I mean, it's actually terrible in some ways, but in some ways, structurally, <laughs> it's not a bad analog for what he was doing. Like you have time moving forward and backwards and scene cuts to all these different things. And Dave Sim is the perfect. He's the perfect comic book artist who's able to tell ten different stories synchronized at the same time in a way that completely flowed on the page. And there was movement his pages everything about it just fit per seamlessly and if you that to me is maybe his greatest strength and there he has many mm -hmm. but his ability to to put a story together and when you the same thing when you see a nolan movie you say who else could have put that together when you watch dunkirk there's three different times moving at three you say how did he even think of that nobody else would have filmed the battle of dunkirk that way well the same thing with dave sim nobody could put time together the way he could put it together not just time, but timing, put in different narratives side by side so that they lined up, uh, arrange the panels on the page so everything moved and your eye moves, ar arrange the dialogue. There's so many elements to writing a comic. Nobody ever talks about that he basically is untouched in all of those things. In my opinion, mm. he's untouched. When we think about other great comic book writers, uh, you know, you talk about Sandman or, or, or uh, Alan Moore writing Watchmen or whatever, uh, different from hell, all the different things. The uh, the writer is dictating the work. But in this case, the artist is dictating the writing in such an amalgamous way that it's the same guy. And he has so much experience with this form. And that's all he's thinking about. He created something that nobody else could have made. Uh, that alone, if it had nothing else worthwhile in it, that alone would be incredible. I don't think it's any coincidence that the only job that Dave has ever had outside of comics was working at a comics shop. 
<laughs> well, and yeah. I mean, what he he dropped. So this is another another thing. Well, first, Sean, I think you could do a literary analysis of Cerebus and all the just the structure of the story and still what he was doing with the story de devoid of the assessment of the imagery and still come to a conclusion that this is a great piece of writing that's st structurally interesting from a purely narrative standpoint. But I do think that would do a massive disservice to the totality of the work. It's not a piece of written literature it's a piece of graphic literature and you are correct i because i'm involved in like higher education um I, I i was teaching at a university for a year and there was a gal there who was actually doing um a master's thesis in comics and i i saw that on a website and i was like wow she's a, and so i reached out and we became friendly and me and her and one other guy went to an academic conference on comics I have never wanted to never read a comic again or shoot myself in the face more than listening to people who can't draw, have never made a comic. Like they're, they're coming from every other realm, like, I don't know, social studies and history and blah, blah, blah. And they can't get it. I'm going to, maybe get myself in trouble but if they tried to get into a history conference they wouldn't get their paper accepted but they like comics and and everyone else has written everything else so it's like how oh, i can go do this little thing about comics and the if you're watching people, right now we mean this with love <laughs> no uh, no <laughs> quick you can leave comic i need mean, the we I all thought, oh out. god it, no i'll say what i'll say and i'll back it like we all think man there needs to be like a serious academic analysis of Cerebus. Like, yeah, that would be great. But also, man, if you want something that you love to become boring and awful and tedious, like give it to the academics. Um, in my opinion, you should not be a comic scholar unless you can make a comic. The Scott McCloud is what we should aspire to. Nick Susanis, who's a guy who made a book called Unflattening. It's a fantastic piece of of comics academia but a historian who's just you know trying to get in to build their resume by having some more academics it it destroyed everything i, I cared about comics so well, there 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 is there is that aspect sorry i that was like i want to i want to take it's your, it's your important though your narrative versus formal analysis and whether these two things have to intersect. So my basic argument is just basically this. You can write a narrative analysis of Mozart's The Magic Flute, but I, the point is that there's a really cool melody and the, the soprano goes, -da 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 -da, you know, I mean, that's yeah. not, the, the, the point is the totality. The point is the experience that you get from the, the visceral experience of the, of the music and the way that the, uh, you know, that the melodies move. And I'm, I'm sorry that I sang that way into the microphone here. Um, <laughs> it's fine. I've got my good mic on today. And so I feel like, uh, you know, I must be performing. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, the, the point is like the way that the harmonic, the, the harmonic development and all of these other, you know, things, the way that he plays with timbre through the different sections. In other words, all these things are things that you don't have access to if you're not a musician. Uh, or you haven't spent an awful lot of time with musicians who are talking their craft. Um, and, and it would be a disservice to the work to divorce. Maybe that's a more extreme example than this because service is obviously a story, right? Uh, it has a story, it has a narrative, um, but it, the narrative doesn't exist naked without these other things. If it did, you just go to Wikipedia uh, instead of uh, reading, reading a Tolstoy novel, right? You just go yeah. read a, three paragraph summary of the brothers Karamazov. I mean, I, I don't think that the, the three paragraph summary of the brothers Karamazov made into a NES game is the equivalent to the novel. <laughs> you know, uh, let, let's not fool ourselves into thinking that the essence is somehow he did this and then he did that. Yeah. No. We agree on something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we, no, I, I mean, I agree. But for as much as I was railing against ac academic assessments of things, there's a place for it. And I'm glad that comics are being taken seriously in that context. 
And that's the whole point of analysis is you break things into their component pieces um, and, and study them under that light. So I guess maybe what I was saying is like, it's fine for a, a liter, a, an academic person who's an expert in literature to analyze it through the lens of literary schemes and narratives and stuff like that. But yeah, don't fool yourself that you're doing a, a service to the whole piece. And you can, you can assess it under the kind of rubric of what's its place in comic history. And that's another thing. But don't, don't come to the comics conference with that. Like that's the history conference. I think the comics conference should be the combination of the words and the pictures. And that's what we're talking about. And, and that they, there does need to be an analysis of that. Looking at like uh, the, an analysis of Cerebus, you know, it, I always think about that, you know, this guy was on the cover of Spawn issue 10, but, but the hottest comic in the world with the biggest artist, the Cerebus on the cover. Now we've gone to a place where people don't even know it exists. You think like people will ever, there will ever be a return to, to looking at this book for what it is. I'm going to predict. Yeah. uh, I'm going to make a prediction for you. Um, This, this will continue to be one of the most talked about visual works uh, of this past century. And um, I, I truly believe that a, significant portion of the lack of attention that it's received post being completed Carson coming to the book aside uh, after it was completed uh, is reputational that you you build up a sort of like knowledge uh, just by sort of word of mouth and things like that oh that guy's crazy or mm. that thing is verboten oh it's too complicated oh it's too this or it's too that and I think that one day there will be an accessible, a widely distributed, fully restored, looks like it was just came off the artist's, uh, you know, drawing boards, 16 volume set that you can buy from your local megastore um, in one big box, and that it will continue to be available in that format at some point in the future. I don't know exactly what the what the catalyst for that is, but I think that time goes by and people sort of forget the sort of more petty stuff, but I might be totally wrong. Someone and you're, that's it. that's the project you're involved in is preparing that that long term document. But I do think, um, I don't know what it is, but it it does seem like Dave sometimes kind of purposely gets in the way of that happening, or just accidentally be, because the way he thinks things work and the way things are working. You know, like his resistance to hardcovers, but as soon as they sell a hardcover, there's, I bet you they could have sold a ton of those and, and not realizing that the audience now is all like guys our age who have money and are going out and buying things in hardcover and that these berserk volumes are selling like hotcakes. He, he heard yeah. that hardcovers didn't do well from Terry Moore in like the nineties years ago. Yeah. And, and he's, he's stuck to that. Um, but they have hardcover omnibus strangers in paradise stuff what? that sells now. So I think some of it is just because because he went hermetic a while ago and intentionally Luddite. I, I do think there's some of that. And then there's just like the internet hate for what they perceive mm-hmm. his opinions to be. Um, I wonder if he, I wonder if Moby Dick is another good analog because nobody a- cared. And it's so weird. It's the weirdest <laughs> book ever. And nobody cared when it came out and everybody's like it's the greatest it's the greatest piece of literature of all time <laughs> but it's totally so. bizarre yeah very 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 similar structurally you could make the argument for uh yeah. i mean it, it, it's once again a, an editor writing heard on herman melville probably would have been like you suppose you could get rid of some of those uh, chapters that are just about bad whaling facts that aren't true yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah which would be analogous to some of the more tedious biblical exegesis at the end. I would, I haven't read Moby Dick cause I hear it's rough, but no, it's uh, great. It's, 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 it's fun. It's a, a fantastic adventure story. It also has all this other stuff and it's, it's unlike anything else, which is part of the point, right? I mean, yeah. you know, 
Uh, was, do you think that uh, uh, that that's a fantastic that would be a that would be a good model I think for the service uh, resurface. We're talking 150 year time scale. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> People all of a sudden realize this guy did this thing. Have you seen it? <laughs> but dude, it, I don't. It may have to. It may have to be a rediscovery. Maybe people of our age who haven't got into it already have a thing in their head like, oh, that, yeah. I, I remember when Cerebus was big, but it's ridiculous, don't bother. And maybe it's a generation of people who are kids now who come up and be like, what is this? It'll have to be a rediscovery. I, but I don't, I don't buy into the narrative that it's totally disappeared either because has it ever gone out of print? Mm. <laughs> and, and is it, I mean, Sean, you know, you're doing remastered editions diamond still orders and it they still sell new copies of that all the time uh like jimmy pointed out jimmy gownley pointed out to us when researching strange death he said he said go to libraries and see i don't know if you did that research or not mm -hmm. sean but he said go to libraries i guarantee that at, la at least have high society and jocka story and see how frequently they're checked out i bet they're checked out about as much as all the time Hell. yeah all the time always all the checked time. out not a so, lot of copies of it, but uh, the ones that are out there in libraries are coming out all the time. It, yeah, it's interesting. It's 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 sort of stayed in <coughs> the some type of conversation, but but reputationally as as not held up as a great work is the reputation. I mean, we've talked about this. Basically, the only real analysis of the entire series. Um, has been uh, Tim Crater's essay. I'm going to go for it and say Crater. Sorry, Tim, if you're listening. <laughs> Crater. Uh, <laughs> I'm just going to cover all the bases here. Uh, edit in the right one, Carson. Uh, uh, his, es <laughs> his essay in, in uh, <laughs> uh, the Comics Journal, issue 301, um, which is a, a really good essay, even though I disagree with the overall conclusion. Although he comes back to the very end of the conclusion is basically like, it is a flawed work. I don't like a lot of it, but uh, all of it is better than all of the things that are held up as championship graphic novels. So basically like saying it's like way more interesting than Moss or Fun Home. Uh, mm. And <laughs> you should be reading this instead, but by the way, it sucks. <laughs> it's like, yeah. you know, he's, he's got an interesting, I, it's not it's not like wholly coherent. I, you know, he, he he's, a, he, he's a cartoonist, but I, I think that his, he's mostly focused on the narrative and the narrative, what he perceives as narrative incohesion. A lot of like what you're talking about, Callian, like it seems to me that he wants the first issue to connect with the 300th issue. And mm -hmm. frankly, I don't think that that's a realistic possibility given the time scale, given the fact that the first issue yeah. is created by a 21 year old and the last issue is created by a 50, and it's not necessary for great art. It, right. I mean, it's completely irrelevant to whether something is a great piece of art, which I guess he kind of admits, but it stands all the same. It doesn't matter if it connects. No. Yeah, to me, that fractured makes is what makes it great. And that's part of like the the evolving character of, of Dave is part of what makes it great. Like, mm. If he had, I mean, he had a vision at issue 12 of where he was going, but it was a flexible vision. And if the work had stayed in stasis instead of reacting to its environment over 25 years, it might be this like perfectly contrived, totally flawless, like, I don't know, mosaic or something, but that would be boring as hell. Like, I think to me, the greatest works or and what I mean by a great work of art is something that I mull over that impacts my life. And I mull over there's stuff that I think is flawless, but I tend to go, yeah, okay, I got it. And uh, yeah, it's flawless things that have the right kind of flaws that keep you coming back and like struggling with it. That's the work that is meaty and Cerebus yeah. has all the right type of flaws in it. And it's because someone evolved in real time in response to the world and the vision changed, but there was a cohesive structure and a, a, there was a plan from the beginning and, and that friction of a set plan, but the rubbing, like Dave didn't plan to become a theist. He planned to make fun of the Bible 
And then he went and bought the Bible to work on his parody of it and converted like way, like became reverse person of who he was. Right. So he couldn't plan for that. And that creates a fracture in what must have been the plan, but he's able to integrate it enough. And that's what, like, I mean, what more could you ask for in a piece of art? I have another question. I wonder what you guys think about this. A great piece of art has to be viewed as great in the time that it is is existing at any given moment. And right now, uh, if something is, we're looking at this from a, an academic standpoint, almost not an academic in the way that you were saying earlier, but <laughs> for the greatness of, of a piece of art. But yeah. uh, everything now is going to be judged on whether or not uh, the identity politics of the day agree with it. And that's certainly not going to be the case with this. So will, will that allow, will that have to change to allow this to see the light of day on a broader scale? Oh, for sure. <laughs> yeah, I think I think that pendulum is, is, has started its swing the other direction. Uh, there was an ACLU uh, tweet the other day that as quoting uh, Justice Ginsburg um, on the third anniversary of her death. And uh, it's a very powerful quote by Justice Ginsburg, basically laying out her judicial argument for why um, uh, banning abortion of all kinds is a tantamount to sex discrimination. And the ACLU bracketed every instance of the word women in her quote and replaced it with person. Uh, And for esoteric identity politic reasons, uh, they did this. And, you know, I won't bore you with the actual details, but the but there was an actual backlash for it. Basically, what in the world were you doing? Like this is five different sides, though. Right. From 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 from, from, I mean, a fairly universal as far as these things go. Um, and that gives, that type of thing gives me hope. Um, you know, this is a quote about sex discrimination. This is not a quote about gender identity. Uh, how dare you change someone's words? You know, and, and the ACLU isn't ready to go out and like ban the ghost of Justice Ginsburg because she thought sex was real. Um, but but they were willing to change her quotes in a public manner. And, and I, I was heartened to see a backlash to that. Uh, you know, not necessarily because I have a particular viewpoint on it, other than the fact that like someone's stated identity is not as important sometimes as other things. And in this case, someone talking about what they were talking about. You can't change the context. Uh, she's yeah. not alive anymore. It's, uh, yeah. it's possible that this that the identity stu- politics stuff. I mean, do you get pushback on your work, uh, Kalyan, like w- when, when you exhibit or things like that? Do you have people that like I mean? No, I, I don't get too much pushback. Uh, my work pretty much avoids a lot of the questions of identity politics and identity. Uh, I'm trying to deal with, uh, I guess, just humanity as a whole. So I don't get that too much. Uh, and I'm, my dad is from India, so a lot of my stuff deals with Indian stuff. And th- I guess there's some identity in that. But for me, identity of the artist is going to come through no matter what. Like, okay, whatever I grew up looking at or thinking about, that's going to be in there. So it's not something I give a lot of thought to. I just assume it'll be there. But I, I bring it back to, to Dave for a second. I, I think it's, I think this discussion, and we've, we touched on just now a little bit, I think you can't have any discussion about Cerebus without bringing in a discussion of was, is the book misogynist? Is he a misogynist? all those types of things, because it became such a major talking point. Uh, We can have the conversation as people who have read it and understand it, but from the outside, it became such a major talking point. And he inserted it in there himself that it's difficult to move away from it. You have, it has to be addressed in a conversation about the book itself. I think, I think it has to be Uh, part of it. In our time or of all time, like you think that's a consideration 40 years from now or 50 years from now? I think times change so much that uh, the consideration may be slightly different, but he put such a focus on it uh, it's, uh, at different junctures that I think it would have to be at least acknowledged. Like, okay, he, this happened. And then the character of Jaka changing so drastically in any critical analysis that has to be looked at. Okay, what happened there? Hmm. B- because well, she went from being a three-dimensional full character to being kind of this, this almost a straw man. Right. I felt like when I read it. Yeah. 
I, I, yeah, I, I think it, I don't know that you're right that the critical, the, the theory of art that you ascribe to is going to change the opinion of this. So this is like, I teach art appreciation and we just did a thing where I go, look, you could have a formalist theory and within a formalist theory, you could have like an analytical formalism or you could have naturalism and you could have an expressivist theory. And within that, there could be like emotional expressionism and symbolic expressionism. And then you can have like critical theory where you're like looking at a work from uh, like gender studies standpoint or a feminist standpoint or, uh, you know, a race theory standpoint or whatever. And, and that you, a good critic is going to be upfront with you about which filter they're approaching a work from. And then you, I think you're also right that the current overriding theory that our culture ascribes to is some kind of identity politics. And then that's fractured into, you know, whichever the people who are interested in that kind of thing are, of course, like going to be advocates. They're going to apply the, the, the theory that most closely fits what they actually consider their identity to be. Like, you're not going to get me being like, well, I view every, well, I guess you do get like white guys viewing everything through like intersectional, um, I'm a black female <laughs> lens or something like that, which is bizarre. But for the most part, people are going to align to the identity. Like women are going to be more likely to apply a feminist critique to a painting than you know, someone who's of whatever ethnicity is going to apply that. So I think that is the dominant, um, the dominant underlying theory for criticizing art at the moment. And I, I, I find that unfortunate because I think it's, it's a component uh, but it's not everything that there is to talk about. I think there's a lot more to talk about. I think, I hope that that will shift, but I think a great piece of art is going to be successful or irritating. Like, and by irritating, I mean demanding discussion on as many of those different theories as possible. And even the fact that a feminist critical theorist would say Cerebus is the worst, most piece of shit misogynist work of all time means that it's irritating and it is successfully form formally. It is successful on all these other, like you, you can't come at it from any of those real, real critical standpoints and, and, and find it not be worth talking about. It's you not know, contemptible on any of those metrics. I I read an interesting piece that was on the Onion AV Club uh, many years ago, and uh, it was uh, written by three different people. And one of the people was Trisha Robinson, who uh, gave an by fax interview with Dave, which is probably Dave's most acerbic interview that he's ever done, at least that I've ever seen. Um, fairly aggressive in the first portion of it, probably partially because it's conducted by fax, and that he thought that the Onion didn't have a, uh, it's all comedy. And didn't have like a you know culture component to it so he thought because it was with the onion av club that it must be like mocking him or something like that um anyway uh this was, was that the one where the first question was why an aardvark or something yes that's he right got he got irritated said, he said yeah. i just finished 300 issues and this is what you're going to ask me but this has been yeah you know this had been like a running thing in his letters page like oh why an aardvark i've been asked this so many times you know i've already responded to this why would you do this basically yeah, that's that's the one. So she wrote uh, a piece several years later. Uh, these three artists or th these three writers were talking about things that have influenced them the most. And Trisha Robinson wrote that uh, Cerebus was the, probably the most influential piece of art she had ever read and that it made her think differently about the way that she interacted with other human beings and made her wonder when she was manipulating other people by the way she asked certain things or the way that she talked or her tone of voice and that she had never considered before how much social interaction actually involves different types of manipulation. And I, I, I have rarely identified so much with a piece of criticism before. And um, I, I thought this was a very interesting, very brief little statement uh, by her that is very true to my experience that like reading the sort of more extreme you know, going home is a good example. So the this is the post issue 200 Jaka and Cerebus uh, travel <laughs> um, thing. Uh, it, it's a 
I think it, there's no doubt that it's more caricatured than their earlier relationship. Um, but it's also no doubt to me that I have learned more about the way that people verbally manipulate each other by seeing a caricatured version of this in a piece of fiction. Um, I, I found it to be influential in the sense of recognizing people in my life who were manipulating me uh, in different ways. Maybe that's a, a TMI kind of thing. <laughs> you know, uh, it, it, I think that he's a good observer and has such an interesting viewpoint that even when he's writing in a more exaggerated kind of mode, he's getting at kernels of truth inside of it that are interesting, especially removed from the context. And I, I think the context is really strong here. We have a social movement of several different decades that basically has initially been about, you know, basically writing wrongs, longstanding wrongs. I mean, you know, I mean, if I was a woman, I would be afraid of men because men are stronger and scary and do things like rape people. Like, you know, the w women are not committing violent crimes in the same uh, percentage uh, that men are and when we're talking about biological sex. Um, so, I mean, th that is a rational fear of a woman to be afraid of men that she doesn't know um, or, you know, men that she does know that sometimes act violently. Um, but but we are now at such a lunatic extreme to it. Uh, it, it, it I can't help but think that those tides will kind of come back in and people will be able to sort of say, well, this guy has a lot of opinions that I don't necessarily have, but he's got a valid set of opinions. And, you know, he was writing in a time in which uh, there were lots of things, you know, that were happening that were not necessarily like totally congruent with how things necessarily should be in a fair society. Um, you know, to use another example, uh, he was, you know, people could say that Dave was paranoid about getting locked up for his views on different times, you know, different times he said, oh, I'm going to be locked up for this and be locked up for that. Uh, in the late 90s, there was literally a man in jail who was there because of the things that he drew. This is in Gainesville. Uh, mm -hmm. He was he was uh, caught up in the uh, dragnet for a, um, uh, a, a a serial killer named Danny Rowling, who was eventually caught. And they got this guy and they're like, hey, look, this guy works as a janitor at a school. He's drawing these really heinous comics called boiled angel they're really disgusting we should look at this guy and he was told by a judge you are not allowed to draw comics i mean literally arrested told he's not allowed wow. to draw comics for a probationary period so like the you know you could say dave's paranoid uh, or you could say well he saw that this happened <laughs> you know in the same time frame in the same cultural climate that he's living in i mean i you know i i, I don't agree with dave um on a ton of you know, the sex or gender stuff. Uh, but what I do agree with is that there are real sex differences and that the sexes are different. Uh, and, well, I mean, he predicted what was coming too. I think there will be, Callie, and you're saying, will it be reassessed? If the tide rolls back on the more extreme identity politics and cancel culture, <laughs> you're going to look at Dave as... And and I think he has an audience out there that he just doesn't know how to connect with. I don't think it's necessarily the best audience at the moment because it's the other end of the extreme that like we've got an extreme. Well, I guess this is my left hand. We got an extreme here and we got an extreme <laughs> reacting against it. And I think he has a big audience here of people who will say, oh, this guy was like prophetic. Now that's dangerous because they're also extreme. But as we move back to the middle, I think people, oh, yeah, you know, look at this guy. He he was right about even though I think he's wrong. This is a very important thing in philosophy. You have to separate out when someone's right on their negative critique of something from whether they're right or wrong on their positive uh, project that comes out of that critique. So I think Dave was right in his negative critique of where this will lead. Um, I think some of his positive proposals are wrong and people seem very incapable of separating out. There's another philosopher, Max Stirner, who pr promotes egoism and he has the best critique I've ever read of socialism. He has the best critique I've ever read of uh, individualist society, any of those, but his positive 
advice to what to do with the conclusion of the negative critique is absolutely reprehensible, but that doesn't diminish <laughs> the power of his critique against those current current systems. I, I rarely pay attention. I, my life is kind of small. Like I just hang out with my wife and my kids and that's what I do. Like when that takes up all your time besides work. So, uh, but I, so I have very little time and I like to, watch movies and read fiction. I'm not too into like heavy stuff after a day. So I, I don't know what uh, modern philosophers are saying. And I don't know anything about anybody. I happened to cross a Jordan Peterson video and I thought, I wonder what the hell him and Dave Sim would have, what kind of similarities they have had in a conversation. I don't know anything about the guy, but I, that made me laugh watching him speak. And I thought about Dave Sim while he was talking. I, tr I tried to put them in touch because I thought Dave's, current audience is a lot of people that are responding to jordan peterson i That's tried what I to, thought when I saw him. yeah um and yeah it, it's it's hard to say that you he's another one where i think he has a lot right to say and then some of his some of the other stuff that he's recommending or his um his fight against ideologues becomes a bit hypocritical in the sense that he's become this massive ideologue himself so it's dangerous in that sense, but his negative critiques of where we're going are spot on. Dave was doing that 25 years earlier. Uh, I tried to get them in touch with each other. Um, a number of Cerebus fans crowdfunded because Jordan Peterson was doing a, you, you could buy his time for like four, you could buy 45 minutes on Zoom with him or whatever. And a lot of people are using them for therapy sessions or interviews. Um, we, we crowdfunded. What the heck? <laughs> yeah. So there's some of that behavior of his and my, my opinion of the guy soured a little bit in trying to go through this interaction with him, but he, he's where I understood Dave as a, as a, that when I said you, you, uh, squish all the juice out of something and get the concentrate and that's what the Bible is. Jordan Peterson kind of made me realize that. And I said, Dave did that for the 200 years. And that's why I thought Jordan Peterson would get a lot out of Cerebus and would have an interesting interpretation. So I thought it'd be beneficial to Dave. And so uh, a couple different fans um, gave me four or 500 bucks and I sent them some sketches or something. And I bought that 45 minutes and I emailed his wife and I, who, who conducts his business. And I said, we don't want to talk to him. I don't want to talk to him. I'm going to send you PDFs of Jocka's story and um, something probably like uh, flight or something like that. That's much more like metafictional, you know, yeah. uh, where, where he ascends, you know, because Jordan Peterson's about these mythologies, too. And, and I said, one's really literate and one's metafictional. And you can kind of flip back and forth between. But I don't want to meet with you. I just want you to read those. And it all kind of fell apart where I got onto the Zoom meeting just in case he wasn't doing what he was supposed to be doing. And he logged in and like something had gone wrong and he hadn't gotten the PDFs printed out that he hadn't got them. And so, and then there was problem with the communication and about 20, 25 minutes of that time we had bought was wasted on trying to get him to get the PDFs and they're big and um, so I don't know that he ever actually read it. And I think that was a huge misconnection. I also tried because Dave was for a minute involved with Ethan Van Skyver, who's big in the comics gate, which is a problematic community on its own. But Dave was writing a cyber frog. He was going to write cyber frog for a while. And then the, the, the alt right people accused Dave of being a pedophile. So now he's hated on both sides. Oh, uh, why? So well, he got, why? he, uh, I don't want to get a whole, into a that. Whole, okay. whole other long thing. If you okay. read the, uh, it, it, it's funny that this is, that became an issue because it was he talked about it back in 2004 in the uh, letters thing, uh, but basically he had had like uh, letters back and forth with somebody who was a fan who was really young, and then later oh. when she was of age they had a relationship for a brief period of time. Yeah, uh, so okay. he was accused of being a grooming pedophile, but that that yeah. lost his connection with Ethan Van Skyver. But in the middle of that. Um, I also had a few phone conversations with Ethan Van Skyver and, and Van Skyver is a friend of Jordan Peterson and illustrated his book, 12 Rules for Life. And Van Skyver was trying to get Dave to do a comic for Comicsgate. 
And he wanted Dave and then me tangentially. Well, why don't you and Dave do a superhero book? And we we're like, we don't want to do like neither of us is good for that. And I said, here's here. You want to do something that will sell a boatload of money. I said, let's take Dave's writing Cyber Frog. And I, I, I said, let's do Cyber Frog licks his own back. And he like licks his back and has a hallucinogenic experience. Like he is a hallucinogenic <laughs> frog. And me and Dave will provide pretty much everything. But you reach out to Jordan Peterson and all he has to do is provide us because Jordan Peterson constantly associates himself with the frog the symbol of the frog as a liminal character and he sounds like Kermit the frog and there's videos of him putting frog masks on and stuff I thought this is genius we'll sell millions of comics because like all of Jordan Peterson's fans Van Skyver <laughs> sold well he sold like a, a million dollars worth of cyber frog it's Dave and and I'll like look all like I'll do all all of the hard art maybe Van Skyver draws the frog maybe Dave draws it and I ink it Jordan Peterson provides the narrative and me and Dave will provide all of the uh, actual, you know, real writing. Like Peterson can kind of just provide us because he's so he's a he's a Freudian. So all he has to do is the frog licks his back. Give us some general Freudian symbology of the the frog symbol as interpreted through your Jungian. And I thought this would be it would be an amazing, hilarious, funny. And then it Van Skyver was like, there's no way he wants to do that. I'm not not going to facilitate that and dave was like i don't want to do pagan uh no. psychotherapy jungian imagery and well, so no uh, one wanted on board but i i tried really hard because uh, that's where dave's resurgence is or current like big sales would come from is from that audience i i, I think that the general flaw in all those kinds of things is just that he I, you know, he, pr he would probably vociferously disagree with me. So, you know, take us with a grain of salt, but I think Dave is apolitical in a certain sense. Um, you know, he's not tribal in that sense. He's a, he's an artist, you know, he makes the things that he wants to make. And this is not to say that he doesn't have any commercial considerations now. Um, but he makes the things that he wants to make and, 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 you know, he doesn't particularly seem to want to be affiliated with other people. And even like, the Van Schreiber thing. I mean, it was like he was writing him faxes that were public. It's not like they were yeah. having phone conversations every day or anything like that. He's just like, oh, here's a fax. This is about the thing that you were saying the other day. Um, I just, you know, maybe that's just my sort of viewpoint on it as a, you know, not that I'm apolitical, but just that to me, like the tribalism is the problem. Uh, the problem is having yeah. in groups and out groups that you've sorted yourself into. The problem is not necessarily that everybody has different opinions. Uh, do you have to have consensus on something in order to get along with somebody else? You know, um, what I don't know if this is the view of an artist. I, but it could be part of the problem that I see with it. Is, and you were saying how uh, in philosophy there's the there's the critique and then there's the solution. Is how I was interpreting what you were saying. But uh, yeah. uh, as an artist people always ask me what does it mean what does it mean i said i don't know because i'm just taking in the world and then i'm trying to interpret it in some way what does it mean i don't know what it means i'm looking at it the same as you and it seems like there's a lot of uh, in the case of jordan peterson from what little i've seen and maybe in the case of some of dave's more firm beliefs there's a lot of knowing going on which how do you know i'm not saying there is an objective truth i'm just saying how do you know like uh it's a it's a very difficult uh, saying that you know and having it come from your mind there must have been already a problem and there's a problem there already how does one understand for example in the case of dave the entire uh history of the universe and how <laughs> everything fits together but there's a knowing there you say how well, how can somebody know that you know and, i mean and that's where he loses possible. his audience yeah, yeah. Do, you, do, you, that, do you think that that's the break where he loses his audience like between I, that's why I was saying I think the not knowing yet persists through guys and a little bit into Rick's story. And then that's where I like, OK, the book changes for me and Dave become and that's Sean why I said didactic. He switches from searching to knowing. Hmm. And well, I feel like that's that's a major shift in the book. And I, I think that's where most people get off board is they're no longer engaged in 
they're, they're no longer reading someone's search, which is much more open and compelling. They're now reading a guy's and, and I don't, I won't agree with anyone that says, well, he's still searching. Like th- those things that he says, especially in later days and stuff that is, and his interpretation of the Bible with Yahweh and all that stuff, that, that is Dave's beliefs. I've interacted with him enough to know that is his belief system. And it persists to be his belief system today. That's where he locked in what he believes. Uh, it, well, just a the quick rebuttal, uh, as far as didactic, not didactic, let's take Rick's story as an example. Um, the entire in-story religion that is founded as Cerebus as the basis is founded by a guy who's had a hand injury and is drunk and is having some kind of mental crisis. So Rick is is the founder of the religion. And, you know, we learn that he is crucified off 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 camera, essentially. Um, but the the foundation is somebody who's already hang having some kind of mental crisis um now that doesn't mean necessarily that dave doesn't mean all those things that spin out of that um but i mean it's all that entire book you see the foundations of the religion that are eventually going to be in place are the softest possible ground you know this is not like the or the hardest possible ground like it, it 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 is I don't know. The Rick story section is very similar, for instance, to like the Mormon faith. You know, you can say that Mormonism is positive for people who are Mormons uh, and that, you know, you can look at things like they're happy and healthy and things like that. But there's no doubt that uh, Mormonism was founded by an illiterate fraud. I mean, (laughs) he's a historic figure. We can look at the documents. We can look at the things that he said and the things that he purported, and they're not true. Um, And so that at least has to give it some aspect of, you know, it, it, it kind of takes the edge off some of the didacticism if the in-character exp- or in-story explanation for some of it is potentially mental illness. Um, I'm not saying that that's the intended viewpoint or that that's how I'm going to interpret it when we get to the, you know, we've reread it or whatever. But I'm just saying that like, there's always, Dave the artist is always putting up barriers for Dave the preacher. I think that those barriers start to fall apart though yeah. at near the ends of Rick's story. And by the time you get into this is what I think about F. Scott Fitzgerald, or that's where to me it's like, like, I, okay, now you're just like I, I, that that's to me where it, it starts more of a barrier, and by the end of it, it's become less. And then from there on out. It's much more like this is what Dave thinks, and I'm using a story to tell it. But. You know, we've we've been staring at your beautiful painting the whole time here. I, I really I, I hope you'll talk us through the, the the panel that you selected and sort of your image process and 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 everything here. Uh, yeah, I I if this piece, um, I like everything. Like I said, I, I don't exactly know what what's going on, but we have a. Uh, uh, I have I repeat um, images of uh, Jesus or other figures in blue uh, to kind of recognize uh, the Hindu uh, deities with that, and I handled that uh, in a very specific way here. Yeah, there, it's been interpreted in a variety of ways. Either he has a stamp on his forehead or he's been shot in the head, <laughs> and then <laughs> and then I got Cerebus up there, and I, that I was very specific about. I wanted that. I wanted to insert the author into the piece. And I picked that panel because uh, in Cerebus, as you guys know, that panel is there and the page continues and you you flip the page and you see Dave drawing this panel. So, and then it zooms out and he's sitting there looking at it. So that fascinated me because that was the clearest form of an artist inserting himself in a work that that I could see other than later when he talks with Cerebus and everything, which that's a little more difficult to put in there and, and more complex too, because this is more straightforward. It's just about the artist and his work in the case of this panel where the rest of it is a little more philosophically uh, gray for me. But uh, I wanted to put that in there. The whole piece, believe it or not, is uh, Basquiat. Um, there's a Basquiat with all these little doodles and everything. And I doodled them all in there. And a f- <laughs> and a fr- the... Um, this is, uh, I, like I said, all my work borrows from other work. So here we have a, a, a Repin painting, who's like the greatest 
in my opinion, Russian painter ever. And it comes all the way across of this uh, procession. And then uh, here, um, Kathy Colwitz, who I think is the, mm -hmm. like a genius, like she's the mm -hmm. greatest, like the greatest ever. I don't know. I, I first saw her work in a museum and uh, it was woman wearing a blue scarf or something was the name of the drawing. It was small like this. And uh, it was in a line of a million drawings by a million artists. And I just stopped at that one. I said, this person is a genius. I don't know yeah. who it is. And I looked at the caption. I said, oh my God. And I looked at all her work and uh, this is in my opinion, the most powerful piece she's done, a, a woman holding mm -hmm. her dead child. And then above it, um, I got an Alex Ross up here. Let's see if we can get that in there. Superman from, I think, Kingdom Come. And then, mm -hmm. of course, this lady here who then has kind of come to dominate the piece, this naked right. lady. Uh, it's the first thing everybody notices. But it really was, um, it wasn't an afterthought, but it, and I realized that it would dominate the piece after I put it in there. But it, for me, it's not the, most important part of the piece, but it had to be there. Something about, and I wish I could look back at what I was thinking when I made it, other than remembering why I put Cerebus there. But um, when I made the piece, I thought it's got to be there. It makes it all make sense. Uh, it starts as kind of a process of collage. I'm putting things together and it's mostly intuition, which dictates what direction I'm going to make. It's the only really explicit thing I've ever put in a piece, um, but it's there. Yeah. And you had to put that one on our YouTube. <laughs> and I had to put it on your YouTube. I, it had to go in there. If this, up to, if this upload gets rejected, we're just going to put a little box just to the, yeah, just to the a, left of your head, okay? Yeah. Yeah. There, there's boobs. There's giant fake there's boobs, boobs there, there. people, yeah. if, I, if my, they get edited. My uh, background is a little suggestive as well. I apologize for that. I hope that that's going to work. But you have, the the pre -pix you have the pre-pixelation already there. So we're That's sad. the origin of the world, right? like Ex pixelated <laughs> exactly right yeah what, what was the name of that painter uh oh uh manet right is, isn't that is it? no it's not manet is that really origin of the world is uh, the the big very large uh, uh, corbet corbet there we go gustav corbet yeah, yeah gustav the, corbet the big, it's a fantastic big painting. crotch shot yeah yeah um which I, was trimmed out they, they actually found uh as, as far as i know they found the rest of the body really uh, I, I don't know if I'm misremembering that. Oh, but I think my, they found we, the rest of the painting where the, 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 it's the full woman and it just got trimmed out to the, the crotch. But Callian, do you think that the the uh, collage or sort of bricolage elements of Cerebus are part of, you, you mentioned before that that's what spoke to you. I mean, do you think that that has a direct uh, connection to your work? I sometimes think about how deep it must go. You know how when th I said it earlier, how when things come into you as a child, how deep it must be in your consciousness. I think Cerebus structurally, in terms of the way I construct a painting or my approach to even um, having things in there which can't be understood. Because I think there was a lot of things in Cerebus early, especially, which can't quite be understood. The idea of uh, my next piece uh, we were talking is gonna be called Something Fell. Uh. And it's the only, I've had two Cerebus references, this one and then one other, and that's the only time I brought that an idea from Cerebus in there like that uh, because that idea of an echo or and things circular yeah. and but there's an element of that which you can't quite understand it's very but to me when you talk about life right which Cerebus yeah. in a broad sense talks about is life um, right there's going to be parts of life that and this may be where Dave fails I don't know but uh, to me from the perspective of one person and I'm so limited there's going to be things that we can't understand when we talk about large topics. And that's where intuition and, and not knowing as an artist, you put it in there. I don't know what this piece means. Why did I do it? I don't know. Uh, but it made sense. There's a part of you that knows that. Um, and I think Dave is the, is even if he knows more than he's telling the audience early on, there's elements of it that even he probably couldn't have understood what the echoes mean, what the nature of all these things are, the, the fake regency of the real regency of all the, there's all these elements in it and it becomes abstract to the point that, that, that it, it actually mirrors life because there's so much nuance, even with it, if you go outside and talk to your neighbor, there's so much nuance of, of interaction and things that you don't know. You don't know anything which is happening almost all the time, what their circumstances, what, you know, all these different things 
And then when you try to speculate on a broad scale, I really think they've, they've set the, the tone for that for me a lot, especially when you read it when you're young. And it's almost even more of a mystery then. You read Jaka's story when you're young and there's these things about uh, romance and sexuality and love right. and connections between people. And you said, wow, it's almost a mystery. And I think that impacted me greatly to, to think about life that way early. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, the you know, my, my case 12, 12 instead of 10, but like I said, same summer, we were probably reading this together. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, the, the, something about the way that the characters orbit each other. Um, mm. you, you said, you said about talking to your neighbor, there's this pe people that you talk to sometimes where you have a kind of dance um, and there's something about them and you where you find that, the, you know, even if you're not moving in the same direction, it, it's like you touch, you touch almost as you pass, you know, there's this, mm. some kind of energy that pulls you, you know, to or, or, or from them and that, uh, you know, there's like a moment of almost collision and then you're off in your own path again. Uh, another thing, as, as you were saying that, another, I'm sorry to interrupt. No, I, no, that's, that's no uh, another th interesting thing about Dave is even when he un explains something early on, later on, maybe he's trying to be more concrete, but early on when he explains something, the explanation still is strange. Like when you, like they bring up how Dave, how Cerebus is a magnifying glass right. or whatever, and how things gravitate towards him. And you, you just think, how did this guy, all these things happen? And he explains it. But still, what does the explanation even mean? I don't know what it means. I mean, yeah, that's, well, and and yeah. and he is undoubtedly as a person similar to the characteristic in this case that he's giving his character. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, Carson and I have talked about that certain people mm -hmm. seem to have a kind of Carson has called it informational gravity, where the way that they think or the way that they behave or the way that they ask other people has the tendency to bring people in towards them for, you know, I, I don't know, uh, that that characteristic is exhibited by Cerebus in different times. And also Weisopt has that. Mm. Uh, and, and there's a very interesting kind of damning, I think that the character means it to be a damning indictment of Weisopt. But uh, the Countess is talking about Weisopt and she talks about how when he's in his garden, all of the servants are, are behind him. And it's like he intends to touch the thing and then they all swoop in and do it for him. And mm -hmm. um, it's an interesting description of like leadership and it's interesting that like Dave as a person who's not a leadership and is not interested in being anybody's club seems to have that kind of informational gravity you know he, and I mean, intentionally manipulates it he is he knows what he's doing I, my experience is that it's a skill set that he has learned I think he had it naturally but I think he I think he knows how to do some of it and it, it could seem like magic, but it may be because he's so adept at understanding psychology. Like, you, Sean, you were talking about there's there's the scene in Going Home that was like the characters manipulating my mm -hmm. my favorite scene. I think it's I think it's in Guys where the 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 girl shows up to seduce Bear back away. I think that's who it is. And they talk and then it has Dave's interpretation of the subtext. And that's throughout the page. Like she says something and then, but then it will be like, but this is what she really means or what she's really doing. <laughs> and I think he's such a keen observer. And I think this goes back to the, like you have to contend with misogyny. Um, he's such a keen observer. And I think for him, like, and, and I don't know, I'm not going to say he's always right, but I think he was right so frequently about what people are doing that, he became uh, more just like just like bored with people or distasteful of humans in general. Like he wants to isolate and it's a painful process to him because he can see all of, of that going on. But because of that, he also knows how to navigate it. It's, it's not magic. It's just like this real deep intuitive understanding of, of psychology. And so I think it's unfair to criticize him for being um, misogynistic when it's something, I don't want to say totally misanthropic, but you, you, when, when it includes a distaste for the behaviors of men and women, and men get a real, you know, running over throughout, I mean, every, hum, it's just humanity in general does not survive his critical lens very well. And so it's a bit disingenuous to say, well, he just hates women. It's like, no, he, 
anything negative he said about women is just a subset of everything negative he has to say about people. about about people and, and so <laughs> but his his ability to see that and then and use it to his own advantage um, gives him that informational gravity he knows how to manipulate the informational environment around him whether intuitively or consciously and i think more consciously i think mix of both but i think he's pretty conscious about it that does give him a gravity and we both passed the event horizon we've talked about that and entered the dave sim vortex and once you're in the dave sim vortex it is like a weight and gerhard i've talked to him about that and he he's and i don't even want to say the term he uses because it would be jumped all over these days but basically don't get near him you'll get stuck and it, it's a hard time untangling yourself so the best thing to do is to just stay disengaged if you want to maintain kind of your autonomous self because you'll get sucked into that and then but i think that there's also like gravity like you kind of have to have your own gravitational weight me and you sean were talking about that and i'm sure cali and i'll be interested to hear what you have to say but we've developed that as artists and so you have to be a compelling enough informational unit yourself you have to have enough gravity to attract like sean we were talking about your buddy who's had all these experiences and that me <laughs> none me of which we you... can talk about on camera so let's uh... <laughs> yeah I, but I, I have a i have a friend who has uh, you would not believe the stories that he tells until you do because you encounter them and you just realize that there are people who are attracted to him when my i i have never had a ton of this myself as an individual but when my wife and i used to play together uh play music together in public uh, we were buskers for several years. We would have this happen whenever we started singing together. It was like everybody around us was was coming in. And I, one particular day, I remember uh, singing in Pioneer Square in Seattle with two of us sitting there singing. And this guy has been intensely watching us for a long period of time. And he's got a, a notebook. I think he must be sketching us or something, you know. And, you know, we've had a very interesting crowd the whole time. This guy comes up to me after we stopped singing and he says, I want to show you something and he flips his notebook over and it's a drawing of pioneer square where we were and it's a drawing of the other parks and he says do you see how they've made a triangle and he goes through and he flips through his notebook and he's got pages and pages and pages of these data points that he's collected in this elaborate theory that there's some type of like power vortex that's being made by the location of these three parks and the totem poles that are there and he says you guys being here is making that power for good instead of for negative, you know, for, for bad. And then he kind of looks apologetic and he's like, I just had to tell you this. And he like walks away and I was just like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it, it, which is all to say that like, w for whatever reason, when we were singing together, we seemed to draw people in like that. And it's funny to describe it to people who have never experienced that. It doesn't seem real, you know, my friend who has all these stories, you, you just, kind of think well he must be making them up until you actually encounter this in the real world and you realize there's just people who are drawn to him you know um the story of Cerebus is one of the few places i've seen fictional analysis of that kind of behavior um uh, i don't i don't know that maybe this tolstoy has some kind of uh some of that and and some of his stories too but uh you know specifically Cerebus and specifically weissop the thing that you said about the magnifier thing i really think of that as a genuine phenomenon that exists in the real world um yeah and and, and you're right it's freaking weird <laughs> yeah and it can't really be explained yeah uh, the way we're talking about it as far as it can go do i uh i think um i always think about uh it's hard for me to talk about myself i always think about steve jobs that way have you ever read anything about that guy Mm -hmm. That's what they'd say is that uh, once you got in his sphere, it was like they said it was like uh, you'd be believe anything he told you. And that's how all these things happen. You'd say, all right, this is what we're going to do. And if you weren't in it, you'd think there's no way we're building a phone, which does. All, there's no fucking it's not going to happen. Excuse my language. And then you'd be in it and you'd work your and then everybody would kill themselves for it. And magically, the thing which he told you was going to happen, he'd be holding it on a stage that that, that that's what and then. When you were outside of a sphere, you'd never do anything like it again because it just you just didn't think you had it in you, and that's and that he could distort the world that way, and that's how 
Apple became a thing. It, it, it is a kind of distortion. It does seem like a kind of distortion. It seems it's like it's analogous to, you know, we talk about gravity as if gravity is like a force or whatever, but gravity is literally a distortion of uh, a field that we can't perceive, we can only perceive that we can't actually see. Um, you know, you think about something having a kind of weight and then pushing out um, as a result of it or pushing in as a result of it. Uh, I think when you make a, a painting, the scale and the density like the one that you've made, you are inviting into the world an object that is bringing other people towards it, you know. Um, you, you have created, I mean, you know, I, I don't want to say like, it's the same as like having a kid or something. I, I'm also a parent. Um, but it, it's a similar kind of like, you don't know exactly what it is that you're doing, right? You know that you want to no. do it. But you're, you're inviting, <laughs> you know, so, something happens as a result of this thing that you've created. You know, the kid analogy works well with with Dave as well, because it's very possible like when you have a kid then there comes a point where you look at it and you're like oh this is a different person it's like a foreigner mm. like yeah you know them very well and you maybe know them better than anybody else but there's characteristics in them that are completely unexplainable that they're just that person and uh you don't know why and you can't figure it out and there's some kind of black hole where they're their own person you can't see something and i think as an artist, I think Dave acknowledged that for a long period, that there was something in all these characters and there was something happening in the story which wasn't him. And later on in the story, it was just him. Mm. And I wonder whether as an artist, it, that's truly part of, like we said, we go back to that's what part of what makes the piece as a whole so great, that it's this so strange, unique thing. But maybe as an artist, that's not the way to go. I don't know. To impose something so concretely on it. Where early on, it's more like a child where you say, I don't know, it's going its own way. I'm just rowing the boat. Well, and later he says on, he says, that no, in, it's, no. He says that in issue 200, where he like talks to Cerebus. And at that point, Dave says, like, kind of like, I know everything that you're going to do. I can give you Jaka, but this is what will happen. Uh, mm -hmm. at that point it's like i can predetermine everything that will happen for you and cerebus chooses to re-enter the story but it's kind of with this acknowledgement now that the creator is kind of in full control and i i think structurally that is very intentional on dave's part because he does mention it earlier he does he had very publicly declared 300 issues and then he plays that funny little game with like sight guys <laughs> I'm kind of sick of it. I've decided to stop at issue 200. Mm. And then it's like, sight guys, no, not really. I was lying. But the story does stop at issue 200. 100%. Most, most yeah. of the characters go away. It's not just that characters change. It's that the majority of the cast disappears entirely. The, the whole story culminates there. And I think that was part of his structure is intentional. But um, to to be and and again i feel like it it actually takes through rick's story a little bit to where dave really takes over but um i do think that's if you're going to talk about the overall structure of service and what makes it great that's a major part of the discussion and i think it was planned and intentional i don't know it was planned from the beginning i do feel there was some point along the way where he realized i'm going to wrap this up around 200 and then there's going to be like the glossary or <laughs> so you know the appendix let, let me just say, say too that, that to me that's the most devastating thing that he ever wrote uh persuading his character that he will never actually <laughs> actually love her um and that they are incapable of being close in the way that he thinks and that's not actually what he wants and he goes through and changes each of her proportions mm -hmm. basically one by one i'm going to change her this way uh, okay, we'll make her so that I won't hit her. Okay, make her like this. And and just going through like that, I, I remember, well, uh, yeah, uh, I, I've had personal experiences where I, I have flashed back to that and thought to myself, like, you know, this is why you let somebody know what you are. 
uh, as early as you can, because, because, you know, you can, especially when you're younger, you can waste so much time trying to withhold the things that are going to end up being the things that, you know, drive you apart. Um, and it's, it's an interesting, that scene, those scenes wouldn't have been possible without breaking the fictional conceit of the story. Um, I mean, I, I suppose Dave could have been, you know, Terum or something, maybe that would be a way to maintain the conceit, but it, it, it seems different somehow for the book protagonist to literally be interrogated by its author. Um, and, and an acknowledgement of the sort of out of control <laughs> aspect of creation, um, because he still doesn't do what Dave wants him to do. <laughs> he persists. <you> know? Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> you know, you were talking about how all the characters disappear. Another thing that disappears is the landscape, which was such an integral, the way the landscape was yeah. such a central part of the book, the tower was such a central part of the book. I mean, I've never seen it's rare to see landscape as a character of its own so powerfully depicted. I mean, it was central to Ascension. It was central to the way they would just show the faces on the side of it. And then you see dialogue coming from the top, the way the story was told, everything. And then every, that's just gone. Like, oh, erase, that, that doesn't exist yeah. anymore. You're a hundred percent. Yeah, you're absolutely correct. And, and maybe that'll be part of the, you know, critique as we sort of take this book by book. But um, I think that both Dave Sim, Dave and Gerhard were visually very hungry for a long time, almost omnivorous. Uh, and, you know, Gerhard, I think, is by nature more conservative visually and that he seems to refine the same techniques throughout. But basically, like it. You, you're 100. I, I think you're definitely right. It's not just the locations that they're in are less visually, uh, you know, exciting. It's just that the book becomes more pedestrian visually, um, and especially in the background uh, area. Um, it, it seems more like, I don't know, make work, uh, yeah. jo jobbing as opposed like to like going, a going home could have been spectacular, but instead it's yeah. nice. I'll be curious to see what you think. Uh, I'm going to send you some of the uh, remastered volumes so you can take a look. Um, uh, one other aspect, you know, we should just sort of tag on here is just that because it is a visual work, representing the visual work as well as possible is, you know, people have not seen the book how it actually should look. Um, unless you've read the most recent remastered volumes, which go up through the first six volumes um, and, you know, include another later four volumes you haven't seen what it looked like when it came off their artboard um you know uh, there is something to be said for seeing something in the most print rich you know nuanced way possible so can you buy the phone books now and they're remastered or how does that work? yeah um yeah the first six um plus reads plus minds and plus going home the first volume of going home so I, okay. i'll send i'll send you a couple of those uh in the mail oh, and you can take a look um, You're in for a real treat. Like what Sean has done on the restoration and what Sean can do with print. Like, you'll be like, holy shit. This is all of this was missing. Like I've enjoyed wow. this work this much. And there was this much more to see in it. It's you're in for, I mean, it's a real special, you know, if you, okay. if you really like the Beatles or something, imagine that all you had was like a, you know, a, <laughs> a, a fourth generation cassette bounce down of uh, mm. half of Sergeant Pepper. Um, mm -hmm. it, 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 it's a, it's a quite the contrast. It's, it's that, it's that, it's that stark. Uh, it, especially because they pushed things so far in terms of fine detail and tone and spatter and all these textural elements. And the printing was so crude that the, the amount of fill in that you get from those fine elements, it tends to sort of flatten everything out to a mid-tone gray. Uh, whereas when you when you can preserve all those elements in print, you get a much more textured, much more nuanced surface. Um, and 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 going home, for instance, uh, it you see that it's a lot more painterly. Uh, the color oh. is is a lot more uh, apparent uh, when the tones are distinct from each other. Um, mm. So you know it's not ambitious uh, like the earlier uh, books, uh, but the but you see. You, you know, you can see all these different value differences and it doesn't just sort of wash out into a black and a, you know, 40% gray. Um, That's interesting. 
you know, I, I guess we've talked about a lot of different elements of it, but I think as an artist, and we talk about composition and story flow and everything, but as an artist, I think it's the greatest black and white book ever made. I mean, yeah. that on top of everything else, I think it's the greatest black, and I haven't even seen the remastered version. Well, I, I still think that. I, make sure that you're in a safe place when you read the Jaka story uh, <laughs> remastered. Just, you know, it, 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 it's, uh, it, it's quite the experience. Um, so, yeah. I, I think what we've been, I mean, you've been spending so much time with us on this. I, I'm so grateful, Callum, that, that you're here. I oh, think, you, yeah. Uh, well, we should start maybe trying to wrap it up just, just so we yeah. can let you go. Um, but, but just like, uh, I think if we could each give a statement on maybe how it impacted us. I mean, Callum, you've talked about it a little bit, but I don't know, some kind of final statement. And then I also want to point out that you're working on the painting Something Fell and you've kindly agreed to join us again in a couple of weeks when the whenever the painting's finished um because i'm i'm really interested in we usually talk about comics but i love your work so much and there's so much in it that i resonate with as an artist and strategies that i'm interested in and topics that i'm interested in um so i'm really looking forward to interviewing you about your stuff and then seeing seeing the new work as well that's that's I, I gotta warn you before I show it to you. It's all, I think you'll get it when I show it to you. Why it's called something fell to some extent. You know, it's gotta have elements of I don't know what it is, but uh, uh, but Cerebus is not in the piece. Yeah. To me, it was just the power of what that meant that worked totally with the piece. Yeah. Meant to me. And I, I want to ask you what what that means to you but we'll save that for the other conversation okay. because i think that's yeah. something that in cerebus fandom is constantly debated because it's never explained and so we're all right. left with our own interpretation so i that's that's something um i really look forward to as well yeah it's gonna yeah. be fantastic and hopefully you'll give us a tour of the painting so we can uh, get right up in your brush strokes uh yeah that'd be cool that'd be awesome yeah and given the richness of this conversation i'm I'm now like, oh my God, <laughs> you know, F great, fantastic. So. Uh, I mean, thank you so much for, for contributing to it. I mean, my, my gosh, um, I, I, I got, you know, got tingles when we were talking about it. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's great to have something to connect over with such diverse people, you know, everybody, all three of us have such different opinions on it. And yet all three have gravitated towards, uh, you know, aspects of it. And in much the same way between you and I at such a young age, it's a strange book to get into at a young age. It would, it's something you wouldn't ever expect. Yeah, right. that's, that's, that's unusual. I didn't, when, when I didn't think you'd say, yeah, when I was 12, I, I read, I thought, no way. <laughs> Cause why would you ever read this strange comic, especially starting yeah. with Jocka's story, which is the least accessible for a 12, <laughs> a 10 year old. It's the least that if I was to give my kid Cerebus, who's 12 right now, I wouldn't be like, here, start with, start with Jocko story and, and go from go from there actually maybe maybe since you already covered like its impact on you which I'll agree uh the the mockingbird nature of it which I got from another source which we don't need to talk about but I think that's something that I resonated in his willingness to be a mockingbird um and the search for truth I think is something common so actually maybe a good question to end it on then is uh, we, I think we've all reread it a few times, at least at different ages. So how, how does it, that's another thing I think makes it great is it paid me extremely different rewards at different ages. And I'm curious if you've had similar experience and, and if so, what, what those, like, which were the parts that resonated with you early, which are the parts that resonated later? Why? Uh, or if it's been a, a steady response throughout for for me early on i liked uh the 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 satire and the, the it, just church and state volumes one and two i think when i was in middle school or whenever that was that, those are my favorite i loved the idea of him becoming pope and his reaction to it that, well i'm just going to get some gold and then i love the payoff <laughs> of i love the payoff of it of I didn't understand it, but I just thought it was amazing. The something fell and breaking the, 
breaking the echo when with the gold ball what's the meaning of the gold i think about that gold ball all the time the gold the gold sphere i thought about making a a piece of art which was just a chest and then it was open and there was a gold sphere inside of it because <laughs> i don't know what it what is it it's amazing there's something i'd love the, the symbols and the the mystery of it I, and mystery is the wrong word because you have a feeling of what it is it's not like you have a feel i love that feeling and then i even love the the conversation on the moon i loved so those two volumes young and then as I got older, you know, I never liked uh, reading reads. I don't know if you guys like reading his prose and reads. To me, it's too, uh, like, a still condescending for me mm -hmm. at times. Like, dude, okay, I get it. Like, just say, like, um, so I never enjoyed that. But besides that, I liked Mothers and Daughters as I got older. I loved his the the meeting of the four of them in the church now, of course the drawings are incredible i can't even imagine what the remaster of that's going to look like but um the church and then the ascent the second ascension and i almost and i don't feel this because i think like i said it's it's a masterpiece that that could only have been created in this time but i almost feel like we were gypped from seeing the plot play out to the third ascension mm. i feel like something was going to happen there and at some point, probably early on, he changed his mind. No, at this point, we're moving on from this story. Hmm. I kind of wish, I feel like the story could have been, so it wouldn't have been what it is, but it would have been, and maybe it would be more accepted if he had just continued this to its natural end, which did hmm. not happen. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm in the middle of uh, remastering The Last Day right now. And um, I think that reading those you know page by page as i'm cleaning them so it's not really reading it's like i'm, I'm yeah. going through and you know identifying what tone needs to be repaired and uh things like that but um you know if i need to replace any photocopies and stuff like that uh rereading portions of the last day has made me kind of connect with it a little bit more in a way that's a little scary uh i've had oh. some kind of health crisis a health crisis last year where i had a neurological issue that um made my left hand unable to grasp with any strength and basically deprived me of any strength in my shoulders for about four months. And um, <laughs> reading uh, this geriatric character's uh, literal last day as he's like struggling to relieve himself by having a fart and his <laughs> last like mercy from God on earth is having a fart as he breaks, <laughs> fall, falls down and breaks his neck. Um, <laughs> You know, I, I, I found those scenes to be more meaningful than I have in previous reads, having had some kind of physical issues. And, you know, I don't know how Dave would feel about revisiting some of those, given some of the health issues he's had in the past couple of years. Um, but um, it's interesting to me that those would be made by somebody who was at his peak health. You know, mm -hmm. he was only in his late 40s or I don't remember exactly how old Dave was in 2004, but, you know, not old anyway. Um, and uh, I, I found those to be more emotionally affecting than I, than I had expected. Uh, so that's been, that's been a primary change for me. And also just sort of, I've, I don't really have any uh, skin in the game in terms of um, the political stuff. I mean, I, th I just think, you know, uh, so that I I feel like I've been able to read some of the stuff like reads in a little bit more value neutral kind of way and just see it as a one guy's opinion um, of how things function. And, you know, uh, I'm a firm believer that the sexes are different. Uh, and uh, so that's not an objectionable opinion to me. And someone saying that they're different um, and getting a bunch of pushback about it, you know, obviously the, the it's, it's more extreme than that. But the, that to me is just like a self-evident. Uh, that men and women are different and uh viva la difference yeah I, I don't so it seems like you two have had a consistent experience one of the things that i think is great is i've I've read it through fully twice i i was reading the volumes as i was buying them but then when i got that digital download i talk about i front to back and then i did when i started working with dave there was for some reason i just it was like he needed me to come into that gravity to work on Strange Death. And I got obsessed with Dave out of nowhere. 
and started rereading the book and then contact him and start working with them. And I think I needed to understand Dave and Sarah better. So I did a thorough reread then. So it's only those two times because it's a commitment. And I, I'm not the kind of guy to just jump in and read a little bit here and there. So the, the first time around, because I was raised in a Christian background and I'm heavily interested in philosophy, and that was like when I was really blossoming into that aspect of myself, I found all the metaphysical stuff, like the most compelling things, um, you know, all of the ascensions and the explanation of the universe. And I mean, the comedy and all of that from the first volume obviously grabbed me right out the gate. But <coughs> that metaphysical stuff was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And even oddly, one of my favorite parts was all the biblical exegesis, because coming out of a Christian background, there was a lot of stuff in the Bible that didn't make sense to me. Like, why is there always twins? Why is it always two cows? Why is it, you know, like I had read the Bible front to back a number of times, like a book, which Dave did as well. Instead of like at, at church, they'll tell you like, here's this little thing. And if you read three chapters a night, you'll read it in a year or whatever. And they read it all piecemeal and in verses. And Dave read it as a narrative as I have and seen these bizarre things in the narrative. And I was really actually really fascinated by all of his bizarre, you know, going back to it now, bizarre explanations. I was like, yeah, it's crazy, but it's actually like a cohesive narrative on all of this shit that I thought was weird. So I was like, yeah, yeah, cool. Like, yeah, it could be, that's like a pretty good explanation. And I was fascinated by that stuff. Uh, when I, and, and I felt like, yeah, reads, was kind of boring. Jocka's story, I, I liked it, but it wasn't like my favorite. You know, I like the high action shit flying around, ascending towers. Like um, Malmuth, I thought was boring. A lot of the stuff where it's just pages and pages of text other than the biblical exegesis, I thought was really boring. Uh, all the, the, the faux Freudian stuff in Last Day, you know, I thought was really boring. When I went back, I found I could not at all read the biblical stuff. I thought, oh my God, I don't care. This is so dense. Um, and a lot of the stuff that I had found boring, like Jocka's story and Melmoth, especially Melmoth was my favorite volume. Mm. Um, and I thought, God, what an amazing accomplishment that you wrote this thing that you're going to consider great. Like if you like it, you're going to consider it great no matter what point of life you check in on it. But as a 20 year old, I would resonate with this half of it. And then as a 30 something year old, I'd resonate with this half. And I'm curious to see now as a 40 year old, how I resonate. And like, I had gone through academia enough to understand the, the baffle gab parody of all the Freudian stuff that he was doing. So that was funnier to me, even though it's miserably hard to read. Uh, <laughs> it was funnier. So I think that's another strength of the work is it's so rich and maybe that's what you talk about it doesn't have a cohesiveness to it it's like my mom always complained about forrest gump it's not one genre like it's just it's every genre and it's like yeah that's what makes it good because life isn't just a comedy it's not just a tragedy it's it's the totality of it and i find it very rich for that and i'll be interesting you know what i think of it i'm scared to do a reread but <laughs> I don't know if it's had this effect on you guys, and I can't say if it's specifically Cerebus that's done this to me, but I always think about my own life. Oh, you have to just go for it and just do this. I mean, he did this crazy thing. Yeah. Like, it's crazy to make that decision. I'm going to do 300 issues of this. It's so, and he's so prolific. I mean, there's so much of it. There's, it's a stack. Yeah. Like, I always think to myself, okay, yeah, just let's go for it. Let's do a ton. Let's never stop. Let's I think it's, I think that affects, I mean, maybe I'm just wired that way, but that resonated with me that he just did it. This guy did this thing. I think you have to be, of, you've got to be wired that way to, it's like that real recognized real, right? Like when you're wired that <laughs> right. way, you're like, that's the dude. I think that's what hit me at like, okay, this thing's at 200 issues. It's going to make it till 300. And like the part of me, that's why it just got mentally tagged is like, I wanted to be, I don't have that kind of energy anymore, but as a kid, I, I think I respected the, the ballsiness of the project and it didn't matter what it was about, but I, I had to see it in its completed form for some reason. But yeah, for sure. 
it's an incredible accomplishment and um i'm i'm uh, interested to see what we find along the way here and uh Kalyan, thank I mean, thanks so much for for being a part of this, and uh, you know, you really just enriched the whole the whole thing, and it's just fantastic to talk to you and to see your wonderful work. Yeah, thank you. You guys were I like I said, I've never talked to anybody about Cerebus who's read it, and so this was really cool, especially <laughs> two guys who have like really thought about it and and are involved in it in ways that I'm clearly not at all. I'm just a spectator, so it's really cool to talk to you guys. Yeah, but you've thought about it as much as we have. Like your thoughts are just as developed. Yeah. Um, so it's it's fascinating, and and it's fascinating that it's developed by someone who is real, recognized, real. Like someone who, I mean, that you work. <laughs> I can see it in your work, the size of your work, the detail, the amount with all of that stuff going on, the amount you produce, um, and and bringing in those like a lot of times. I mean, Sean, you say it needs, it's something that needs to be evaluated by people who make comics, but um, I think it's really rich to talk to another person who's influenced by it, but has well, gone on to be a fine artist. Vi visual, this... yeah, vi visual people. I mean, uh, obviously, Kalyan, uh, you're, you know, you're, <laughs> you're an incredible uh, visual artist. Uh, specifically, I mean, you know, we've talked about this before, but your neurology is, is actually different depending on if you've made uh, images and the amount of time that you've made images with. I mean, we have devoted p larger portions of our brains to our visual processing and uh, specifically our visual processing in conjunction with uh, hand-eye coordination. I think that that makes you uniquely equipped to analyze a piece of visual art in the same way that like you wouldn't expect uh, somebody who's not a pilot to hop into a cockpit and be like, oh, you should probably go to the left here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, you know, and even from the state, I don't make comics. Uh, I don't think I'm wired for it. That's what I realized. I tried to do when I was 18. I, I took a year off. I graduated high school, so I'm going to make comics. I could, I'm not built for it. I figured that out. I, the, like, I have to follow my intuition. Like, all of a sudden, my story would be something totally different. I'd be, yeah. I'd, I'd reach issue 201 by page three. Like, I'd it'd be something. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> so but uh like in terms of visual flow i think dave sim is probably one of my primary influences like the way he makes something work on a page i think about that that's i mean not directly really to him but i think it's all in there i think it's in yeah. there so yeah well i i think again thank you so much for joining us and i i really look forward to checking back in a couple of weeks and focusing on all of those types of topics in relationship to your work more because yes. i I think there's a lot to pick up on on how I do think you're actually kind of still making comics in a sense, and you're not just a visual artist. You there's there's a heavy symbolic and linguistic component to your work that I'm curious to explore and and all of that. So I, I really look awesome. forward to that. No no all pressure. Right. So if two weeks no turns pressure. into a month, uh... yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, when I, I think when I... I think next week it'll be done. So then I'll fantastic. You know, I'll message you guys. We'll figure it out. Yeah, whenever something fell is done, we'll do like a, a something fell release party. And I, I really, really, really do want to take like a deep dive into your your background and what you're up to as an artist. And there's so much I see in it that I want to talk. So thanks so awesome. much for, for joining us for this. And I, I, I really thank so much for being willing to come back. And, and yeah, that, if, if that, people have enjoyed this, I think this is by far the richest conversation we've had i hope people enjoy that and i hope you check back to, to hear more about callian's work because i think it's going to be doubly or triply interesting awesome i really appreciate you guys this was a lot of fun thanks for yeah. listening everybody hope you thanks. guys have, have a, good a good one, one. What's the audience, smash that subscribe button and the like button and the bell and then you get them